We do have one, there's one written question left that I'll start with. It was, uh, and I'm going to uh, address it to uh, Lucas first. And it, the, the criticism, the question says, ask, how do we respond to a very, a criticism that you often hear directed against Austrian business cycle theory? And it's the criticism that the theory assumes that entrepreneurs make systematic errors, you know, sort of in this cons consistently and in the same direction. That if entrepreneurs know the boom is artificial, uh, why do they invest anyway? Uh, why can't we avoid the business cycle? So if entrepreneurs are rational, then why would they malinvest when the interest rate is artificially lowered? And Lucas addressed this in one of his lectures, and then maybe some others can comment. Sure. Sure, yeah. I'll say that there are basically two answers straight to this question. Right. One would be that when we look at the business cycle and the Austrian view, right, it's all um, initiated by this decrease in interest rates from the credit expansion. Right. So uh, one explanation would be that normally right, interest rates are a pretty good signal that entrepreneurs can trust, right? so they you know, develop this habit of trusting this particular signal. When it gets pushed down artificially, they don't know they should stop trusting it, right? and so they just react to it like they normally would. Um, despite the fact this is an unsustainable decrease. Right? So that's one possibility. Um, I actually don't like that explanation that well um, for various reasons. And I think that really doesn't answer really the objection. Right? The objection is that entrepreneurs should be really good at foresight in the Austrian view. So they should actually be able to figure out that this is an artificially low interest rate that is going to correct and they should account for this. And that's normally the way this is presented by people like Brian Kaplan say. Um, so I would add in a different approach and suggest that there's a heterogeneity in entrepreneurs. Right, so some entrepreneurs are really, really good at foresight. These are the people that typically would control resources in the economy because they can earn profits on a regular basis. Other people are generally lousy entrepreneurs. Right, they would lose money and therefore end up losing control of resources in the economy. Right, so normally that's what would happen. So entrepreneurs that are actually entrepreneurs over long periods of time are really good at what they do. Um, but then what happens right, when we start an Austrian business cycle? Right, those entrepreneurs that are really good at what they do, see what's happening, realize that they don't want to be part of the bust, right? so they start backing out, especially as we get toward the... Right, so the really good entrepreneurs start backing out, they um, exercise less control over resources, this then frees up resources for those people that are normally not very good entrepreneurs to then take control of the economy. Right, so the reason that we see lots of errors isn't that our entrepreneurs who are brilliant start becoming idiots, it's that the people that are idiots that are normally not allowed to be entrepreneurs are allowed to be entrepreneurs once you get to a certain phase in the business cycle. Uh, one thing also, uh, Austrian business cycle theory is a theory of trying to explain the business cycles that occur if uh, investors didn't uh, use the extra uh, money available through the uh, expansion of bank credit, then there wouldn't be a cycle. But that isn't a problem with Austrian business cycle theory. That would just be saying there wasn't a cycle. That was a point, incidentally, that uh, Mises made. There's a, Ludwig Lachmann raised a, a similar objection, and Mises had an article in uh, Economic in 1943 called Elastic Expectations in the Trade Cycle, where mm. he gave this response. Uh, you know, in the, in the standard way of expositing the uh, business cycle with, on the chalkboard and so on, uh, you typically start out with uh, the Fed lowers interest rates, and this creates an artificial boom. And then the, the naysayers look at it and say, well, why do all these dodo heads entrepreneurs uh, take the bait? Why don't they figure out, you know, as time goes by that this doesn't work. But historically, uh, it turns out that, and, and this is true even with the episode of the Great Depression, that uh, you don't have any of this dramatic lowering of interest rates. What you have is technological inno uh, innovations that put upward pressure on interest rates, but the Fed keep, takes the upward pressure off by pumping in new money. So in other words, they're lowering it relative to what would it would have been uh, had they let the interest rate rise, okay? Uh, and then you, you could hardly expect 
entrepreneurs to catch on to this. You know, they're, they're not going to they're not going to catch that. They would have to be better economists than most economists. <laughs> okay, there's only Austrians that are privy to that, and then in in real time, even the Austrians aren't likely to pick that up. They're, it's going to be looking at a historical record after the fact to see what uh, what happened. I've heard uh, several expositions where somebody who is uh, suspect the Austrian theory is wrong almost make a parody out of it. You know that interest rate lowers and nobody understands what it means. You know and so on, and that's that's just not uh, not the right way to look uh, look at it. And by the way, I think I might have said this in an earlier lecture, but uh, in some give and take with Milton Friedman on the issue of business cycles. Uh, he sent one letter that had attached to it uh, a plot of movements of the interest rate during the boom. And his whole point was, see, it didn't change much. You know, so they, so, so much for the Austrian theory of the business cycle. When, when the uh, issue really is that it would have changed, it would have risen uh, as... Uh, technological developments cause entrepreneurs to want to borrow more money to take advantage of those developments. Uh, and for that reason, we got a business cycle. Um, is this working? Yeah. Uh, I want to add uh, 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 something about behavioral economics, which I've been convinced um, as time has gone on is important when it's um, used within the framework of, of, of sound theory. So there's an economist, Brendan Brown, who's written on um, a number of books that are very Austrian-oriented. And he points out that in every cyclical uh, upturn, there is a, a very convincing story that is told that entrepreneurs buy into. Uh, and first of all, they don't know Austrian economics. right? They don't have a model of the economy in which the Austrian theory applies in their heads. And so in the 1990s, after 1995, that speculative story, which was accepted and then and disseminated by Greenspan, was that we're we're living in a new economy where um, productivity is increasing tremendously, and entrepreneurs bought into this. I mean, they're 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 not economists, uh, and many economists bought into this. And then later on, with with the tech bubble in 1998, 1999, uh, th there was another speculative story to 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 support investing in companies that hadn't returned any profits whatsoever for, for the last two or three years. And then in, in, in the mid-2000s, before the, two, the uh, during the run-up of housing prices, there was a speculative story about the insatiable um, appetite of, of, of Chinese and others for, for U.S. capital, and that this savings glut was going to keep, keep the boom going. And entrepreneurs, they, they, they read the papers, they, they, they read the media, and they buy into those things. And, and those are things that can cause the boom to be longer or shorter. And I think that's important to look at this stuff. There's a very good book by um, uh, Brendan Brown called um, The Global Curse of the Federal Reserve, in which he, he shows that the Fed set off these two booms in the 90s and the 2000s, and what speculative stories were told. He has a number of them to keep the boom going. Mises alludes to this very point in the 1943 article, too. He says something like, uh, you know, well, the reason entrepreneurs are not better than they are at anticipating, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the boom is because they've been taught Keynesian economics. I mean, because Keynesianism yeah. in 1943, is this is what they have been taught. This is what they have learned or, or non-Austrian business cycle theory. So it's like entrepreneurs, the, the, the criticism that the questioner raises assumes that the behavior of entrepreneurs is independent of education, independent of what theories are popular, independent of the culture, and so on. I mean, if we believe in this criticism, that should simply make us want to double our efforts to teach sound economic theory. So other, other questions or comments? Jonathan. Uh, what's the difference between Hayek 1 and Hayek 2? Is there a Hayek 3? And what did Rockford think about all these people? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you want to start with that? Or? David? David? Well, the, I think the Hayek 2, uh, this, there was a 
economist Terence Hutchison who came up with that. See, what had happened was uh, Hayek, of course, started as an Austrian economist under the influence of Mises. And Hutchison claimed that, see, in the uh, 1940s, when Hayek was professor at the uh, London School of Economics, uh, Karl Popper, I think after World War II, became professor there also. And he and Hayek were friends. So uh, I think Hutchison claimed that Hayek had rather converted to Popper's philosophy, which is very different from praxeology. So that's a Hayek two. Now a Hayek three. Uh, some people say that there. I think there was a, a Cambridge writer Fleetwood who said that Hayek had abandoned methodological individualism and he was more interested in the complex structures of organizations. I tend to be rather skeptical of these various changes. I think Hayek maintained at least his version of Austrianism throughout. And I can tell you, when I was in his class in 69, he certainly didn't abandon methodological individualism. That was fairly late in his career. Uh, if you, Jeremy Shermer has written on that. Also, he would be a good one to read on that. David, is your skepticism, is that Gordon 1 or Gordon 2? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I see you've got my number, but I'm not sure which one it is. I want to add something to that. I, I mean, I think many of us would think that the, Hutch, uh, Hutch, the Hutchinson distinction is a little bit superficial anyway. That, and this relates to what David said, um, Joe has written some good pieces on, on Hayek, uh, uh, Guido Holzman has ex done a very nice exposition of this point in his Mises biography that, you know, Hayek from the, from his earliest days was not completely a Misesian as we would, as most of us are, that Hayek and Hayek's contemporaries were highly influenced by Schumpeter, m more influenced by Schumpeter than by Mises, at least kind of methodologically. And I mean, there's a sense in which you can call the early Hayek's work sort of praxeological, but um, it's still very Valrasian. Um, and isn't that your term, Joe? That Hayek is a Valrasian, verbal general equilibrium theorist, yeah, yeah, tradition yeah. of Wieser. Yeah, from the very beginning, he was a student of Wieser, whereas Mises was a student of von Bawerk. And uh, Hayek was already um, a, a trained economist when he came to Mises. He said that, that when he began to work for Mises, he was already a trained economist with a PhD, heavily influenced by this great man, uh, Friedrich Wieser, who um, was a, a sort of a verbal general equilibrium economist. And no doubt, Hayek was also influenced by Mises, and, but the seeds of Hayek, too, in my view, were, were within Hayek um, in, you know, from the very beginning. And then they blossomed when he came to the London School of Economics. Uh, there he uh, urged uh, a bright, young British student, um, John Hicks, uh, and one other student, um, I think it was Abel Lerner, to read Pareto, who was a, a mathematical general equilibrium theorist. And uh, that was un very unfortunate because it led to a revolution in economic theory that by 1939 had completely submerged the uh, Mengerian tradition, the tradition of Karl Menger. And I, I think went further than Hayek wanted it really to go. Um, because I think in a later interview, he said something like, well, if you like that kind of thing, uh, Paul Samuelson has, you know, is a culmination of all this. And Samuelson's book on foundations was completely mathematical. So I, Hayek was trying to isolate the part of economics he called the um, uh, theory of choice. What was it called? Pure, pure logic of choice. So he, he thought, thought that there was, he wasn't a complete general equilibrium theorist, but he thought that there was some general equilibrium out there that the market economy would always be moving towards. And the way that it was moved towards that, he came up with these uh, articles on knowledge, use of knowledge in society. They say some very interesting things, but he was trying to break out of the, the Valrasian box and show that, well, we're really not in equilibrium, but, but equilibrium does sort of guide us in some sense. So he's very complicated, his thought. And I think uh, uh, there, there is a Hayek 1 and 2. But, but the Hayek 1 came roaring back in the 1970s after he won the Nobel Prize. He started attacking Keynesianism. And he was, um, his attacks were very, very provocative. And he had stopped doing that in the 1940s. Okay. 
Jonathan, does that help? Um, uh, but you also asked, I think, uh, did Mises express any view on the... Yeah. Oh, oh so, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I'm not recalling that Rothbard ever said anything about the Hayek 1, 2, or possibly 3. He was tended to be quite critical of Hayek's views, especially some of his later work. He tended to view Hayek as rather an irrationalist. Uh, Joe has written on this quite a bit, so I'll... Yeah. <laughs> there was a, a, a footnote in one of Hayek's articles. I can't remember if it was the 37 article, Economics and Knowledge. It may have been that article, um, which Mises liked very much. Um, and, and, and Hayek later on in his autobiography, or his sort of memoirs, uh, said something like, well, Mises didn't realize that what I was saying in that footnote was really uh, attacking his position. So uh, Murray was not very happy with that. Um, so he, he, he made some remarks about you know, Hayek not being fully ingenuous when he you know, wrote that footnote. Yes, please. I can see about the, the fact that artists, uh, as it sounds in debate about whether uh, human's actions uh, are driven by rational or, or whether it's driven by desire. So what is the, uh, the answer um, in terms of fact the artist? Well, you see, the way Mises uh, used rationality, it's an extreme... Can you the question? Oh, the question was, is in praxeology, is it assuming that people are motivated to act by rationality or by desires? Does praxeology have anything to say on that question? Well, the way Mises used the concept of rationality, it's extremely easy to satisfy. He thought all action is rational because the actor has a, a goal and he's using means that he thinks is appropriate appropriate to attain that end, even if they aren't or not. I don't think there'd be any contrast with desires. Now, on one way to understand action, which is, is popular in philosophy, I think Mises accepted that, accepted this. To explain an action, you have to have the actor's beliefs plus his desires, so all action would involve desires. There wouldn't be any contrast between reason and desire there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please, here, and then we'll... Okay, my question is also on praxeology. Um, and I, I don't understand why it has to be broken down to a single individual. Like, each individual has conflicting desires and things they have to weigh, and so would a government, for example. And I thought kind of the idea was um, to see what actions are taken. Um, so I'm used to like a game theory where you can compare people or governments or something. So I think I missed some theoretical part of that or something. I'm kind of curious if you can help me clarify. I'm not understanding your, your question you say is why you would have to explain everything just by reference to one actor. Is yeah, that I, thought, I, I thought it was broken down to the individual. Oh, well, it, it's always individuals who are acting, but it isn't that everything that you're explaining is in terms of what one individual does. I mean, you can have things that happen that involve all sorts of different individuals. I mean, in any uh, sale, there is a buyer and a seller. That's two individuals. So, I mean, is your question, you think that praxeology would just be an individual or not. Oh, well, I mean, acts. they would, you, you would certainly have, you could certainly have uh, governments doing things, but that would have, or that would have to be cashed out in terms of individuals who are acting. But you would certainly have, you could certainly have cases where you have to bring the institution into the explanation. That's quite. Uh, there may be particular. Sociology. I mean, there may be particular problems where the level of, where you don't need. You know, what level of reductionism you need may sort of depend on the problem. So just for shorthand, you know, we say all the time, oh, the Fed lowered the money supply. 
I mean, technically speaking, that would be a violation of methodological individualism if we, if we said, well, the Fed is a single actor. No, the Fed doesn't act, but that's just shorthand for saying, well, the open market committee met and there are this number of members and this is how they vote. Then they gave it, voted, then they gave instructions to other Fed employees who clicked certain buttons on their computer and so forth. I mean, but, but you know, sort of between friends, we know that's what we mean when we say the Fed lowered the interest rate and it doesn't really, it's not harmful to our explanation. But is that what you mean or? That answers it because I was kind of under the impression you could not explain an action like the Fed lower interest rates. Yeah. But as I said, I mean, but, no, but I'm, I mean, you know, yeah, philosophic. I mean, in one sense, it's really not a full explanation. It just we all understand what we mean by that that shorthand. And and exactly, if if Roger Garrison is giving his business cycle lecture, and he says, well, the Fed lowers the interest rate, the following consequences occur. I mean, the exact mechanisms by which we got to the Fed's decision in terms of the specific beliefs and actions of all the people who work at the Fed is not relevant. That's just not interesting or important for telling the story that Roger wants to tell. But you can imagine another applied problem where we want to know why do the regional presidents disagree with other members of the board and how is Fed policy set? Well, if that's the question, then obviously we cannot treat the Fed as a single actor. Yeah, I, I was going to say something... Uh, Murray Rothbard once wrote an article after the collapse of, of South Vietnam in which he said, you know, on one day there was a, a South Vietnamese army, meaning all the people adopted the same goals as the South Vietnamese government. Um, and it was, I think it was the fifth largest army in the world, there were millions of men in it. The very next day, the, there was no South Vietnamese army. They stopped adopting the values of, of the, go the government in Saigon when they realized that it was going to fall. And so people, you no longer could talk about this, this organization because there wasn't a commonality of, of, of goals. But there was individuals who were participating in the army and, and, and then who were participating uh, and following other goals later on. Well, one thing I think also very important is supposing you're explaining why the Fed lowered interest rates. If, if you're giving a explanation uh, consistent with methodological individualism, it doesn't follow that you can get rid of the Fed and just say, well, forget about the Fed, we're going to talk about the individual. You have to go through stages. This is a point uh, uh, Bob Nozick made in his article on Austrian methodology. You can have stages of an explanation where you can't get rid of the stages that it have the institution, but then they're reducible to actions of individuals. I remember once in conversation, it was kind of funny, there was a book he was talking about by Alan Garfinkel called uh, uh, Forms of Social Explanation. I think Garfinkel had just visited him at Harvard and he was saying he thought Garfinkel was stupid because he missed that point. <laughs> I have a session about uh, shared diversity's uh, comprehensive plan and uh, shared diversity support uh, industry cluster policy to create an economy of scale to expand specific industry like uh, Boeing or Microsoft. So, according to this plan, shared diversity think, uh, they have a right to invest uh, subsidy to some specific industry. And uh, today, Japanese local city pretend. Uh, the Seattle State uh, same plan, so I think Fukuoka City, Fukuoka City now try to create a new uh, industry cluster policy and, uh, so, and to begin a new business. And uh, my, my my friends uh, at the plan, I think they have a right to get the subsidy from the local government, but uh, I don't think so. So the so, so program is uh, uh, this is also an economy can create an economy of scale with a subsidy from local government and uh, how, how is the appropriate way to pass it So, so are you asking, do we think that a kind of like infant industry argument with increasing returns is a valid justification for state subsidies for industries? Uh, so like, uh, what, what's your question? So point is, so like a Boeing or Microsoft uh, needs uh, some 
big budget to begin new business because they can't begin, uh, they can't create an airplane or yeah. a computer with a very short budget. So then they need a some appropriate a big budget to, yeah. to, to together it's, they need a subsidy from government. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, good. Yeah, uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, I, I think it doesn't follow from the fact that you need a big capital fund to start a particular line of production that you need a subsidy, right? Because uh, frankly, the uh, capital funding uh, always comes from the world capital markets, whether, whether the government you, you know, uh, floats a bond and then gets the funding and provides a subsidy or whether it's just done directly to, uh, to the business. And the world capital markets are something like uh, two hundred and twelve trillion dollars, and so, so there's plenty of funding, in other words, to to build a new airline or to uh, you know have a you know to start a new auto company or uh, and we see this sort of thing all the time. So so I don't I don't I don't think it's a very good argument uh, in you know to uh, to justify government subsidies. Is that was that the question? Uh, so uh, this is a very specific problem for Japanese, but. Uh, so if people can't get uh, direct finance, equity. Di direct equity oh, from the investor, right. because uh, so it means if we want if we want to begin new business in Japan, we, we have not just bad to uh, borrow money from the bank in direct finance. So if, so and the Japanese bank have no talent to, to be still what kind of an uh, enterprise mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. But, but you're just describing a, a particular institutional framework where there's some the barriers that prevent Japanese entrepreneurs from from accessing some of this global capital that Jeff is talking about. I mean, but I, I want to challenge another aspect of the of of, of what I think is a, a premise behind this kind of argument. I mean, it's true that to build an airplane takes a lot of. Uh, you know, an airplane is expensive, but it's not the case as people sometimes argue from kind of an industry structure perspective that, you know, Microsoft is huge. And unless, you know, Donald Trump or Richard Branson or somebody decides to throw all of his resources into creating a software company, you know, in, in, in one moment, it's impossible for anyone to compete with these firms. They have a de facto monopoly simply because of their size. Therefore, we have to break them up with antitrust or whatever. I mean, I was just thinking about airlines. I mean, th that argument assumes that the only form of competition is sort of full, direct, head-to-head, -head, multi-market competition in, in every market in which the incumbent is currently active. But of course, you can have all kinds of small competition that kind of nibbles around the edges and potential competitors can get very large and successful by doing that. Even if you think about airlines, I mean, the only profitable U.S. airlines are Southwest and JetBlue and some of the small regional carriers that, exact, that do not compete head-to-head -head with the legacy government-subsidized carriers. Um, if you think about air, airplanes themselves... I mean, yeah, there's in the market for gigantic wide body jets, there's two companies, Boeing and Airbus, both of them heavily subsidized by governments. But I mean, if you look at smaller planes, there are, um, you know, firms that started out making the little regional planes like Embraer and ca the Canadian one there. I mean, they get government subsidies, too. But, uh, you know, they now are building bigger and bigger planes that compete head to head with the smaller planes made by Boeing and Airbus. And there's no re reason in principle why those smaller companies could not, if they want to, begin to build jumbo jets or larger jets and so forth. So, And they started out with nothing. They started out small. So there already were powerful incumbents, but new firms entered the market, started doing small things, competing on some margins with the incumbents, but doing it very well and being more profitable and growing. And then eventually get, they get to the point where maybe they topple the incumbent. So not only do you not need a subsidy to be in that business, but you don't need a subsidy or, you know, government antitrust, an antitrust lawsuit to get into the industry where you could eventually compete more head to head. Uh, please. 
So throughout this week, we've been taught about what the Austrian school has come up with and like they've found out. And my question is, what are Austrians still trying to figure out to this day about like how the world works and like what new fields of economics like we still haven't really touched on? I think one of the, I guess one of the uh, interesting questions that uh, the world will face, at least it appears that the world is going to face uh, pretty soon, is uh, monetary reform. Is some what exactly will the configuration of the world's monetary system? Now, how will this develop? And uh, you know, will we get um, a variety of, uh, so to speak, experiments on the part of uh, states uh, in various or private initiatives uh, that would uh, uh, you know try to address the problems of the of the, the uh, dollar system or the problem that the euros been facing and so on. So I think that's a pretty live area for us to uh, continue to think about and to uh, research with respect to, um, you know, a variety of different possible uh, entrepreneurial uh, ventures that would, that would uh, provide a solution to the monetary problems of the world. Uh, following up on what Jeff said, uh, this war on cash that states have undertaken, particularly Scandinavian states, but, but also Italy and France, uh, with, under the cover of the war on terror. Uh, I think we have to talk about that. I think we have to analyze the long-run effects of that. Uh, there's now, you know, Ecuador it's sponsors, has, is the only country that has a state sponsors, sponsored electronic money um, system in which people can use cards or or mobile phone to mobile phone means to pay, and that's a and, and all banks are forced by law to be uh, to, to, to provide that service. So what they're trying to do is is, is to digitalize all money and, and get rid of cash. You know, that's pretty clear, and they're doing that for two reasons. One, they want to track all of you; they want to spy on you, and this, uh, all of us. And and second, they they want to prop up their unsound. Banking systems, which you know are, are, are shot through with moral hazard, and so if there's cash that you can withdraw, then you can bring these large banks to heel. But but once all, all all transactions have to go through the banking system, then reserves are just moved around. There isn't any way to drain the reserves out of the banking system and and, and to rein them in. So I think this is a very important area of research for economists. So far, I've really been one of the few that have been doing it. And I've also noticed that journalists are picking up on this, and the, the word war on cash, the term war on cash, is being used more and more. I think two areas that I have in mind kind of fall under one broad category. Um, that is, how does the knowledge that we have as Austrian um, economists interact with some current fields that are more mainstream? Right, so uh, I think something I've just gotten interested in recently is the interaction between what um, urban economics or land use economics, how does that, um, what insights do we have as Austrian economists that know about business cycle theory, how does that then interact with, say, land prices and the like, in the way that's often treated um, by the mainstream? Um, I would also include under that, as um, Dr. Salerno mentioned, uh, what does behavioral economics tell us about people's behavior, right? So, in a sense, it's not doing economics, strictly speaking, as praxeology, but it does tell us something about the way people behave and make decisions. Um, and I think thinking about how these things relate is a useful field. Uh, one thing that I think has changed about application of the Austrian theory uh, is the concept of just, of just where uh, the new money goes when the interest rate is lower. And... Uh, I've sort of caught on to this when I had some student somewhere, I don't remember where it came from, but a question out of the blue it had to do with uh, Fritz Mocklip's, um exposition of business cycles, and he says that, that uh, new money uh, through cheap loans always goes into fixed capital. Uh, this is a more roundabout process and long-term durable and so on. And that was probably the, about all you had to say at, the, at that stage in the game. But uh, in recent years, we, we've needed to broaden the idea about what, uh, where that money goes. 
Uh, it goes into interest sensitive areas for sure, but and of course fixed capital used to be the paradigm case of that. But uh, more recently, uh, it, it goes it could go into to all sorts of uh, software uh, uses, and I say that because I remember the dot com boom, which sometimes even the Austrians say that's a different kind of cycle because it wasn't heavy industry. <laughs> But in fact, uh, it, it was uh, an Austrian business cycle in the, sense, in the sense that these companies had to build market. That was the term that was used. You had to build market, which means essentially you've got to operate with losses uh, until you can get your software uh, to be uh, more widely used uh, in order to make it profitable. Uh, and you do that by uh, absorbing those costs with borrowed funds, <laughs> and so and so simply building market uh, constitutes long-term uh, investments. And so a lot of it is just is just realizing how uh, that Austrian theory applies, depending on just what what the economy looks like. I'll add something too. Those these are all uh, macro business cycle topics, but just on the on the micro side, <clears throat> you know, I, I've thought a little bit about how would production theory and our analysis of the productive process be changed by some of the very interesting kinds of technological innovation that we see. You know, nanotechnology. Uh, what about three D printers? Right. I mean, a lot of times when we analyze industries and we analyze the effect of changes in demand on industries, I think this was in one of the exam questions, you know, usually we treat human labor as a relatively less specific factor than many kinds of capital goods. And labor is more mobile than most kinds of capital goods. And so we think that, for example, when, you know, demand decreases, uh, wages will not fall as much as rental prices of capital goods because labor can move to other uses and so on. Well, what if most of the capital, you know, is produced by 3D printers or something? Uh, maybe maybe a 3D printer is actually less specific than most kinds of skilled labor. And so in trying to analyze the effects of different kinds of industry changes on wages and on capital goods prices, it may be that we have different kinds of capital goods now that have different properties from the sort of more conventional ones. Uh, they have uh, you know, many more potential uses than the typically kinds of specific, the narrower set of uses. How does that affect the structure of produ production in the economy? There may be some business cycle implications for this more kind of flexible capital. I mean, I don't know that anyone has really thought this through in a very systematic way. I mean, notice that nothing that anybody has talked about yet is about sort of fundamental alterations in the underlying theory, but how the theory applies to different contexts. I mean, that's always changing, and so there's always new problems to be solved uh, because of institutional changes and political changes and technological changes and so on. This gentleman was next, I think. Um, so my question is... Uh, I, I've been hearing this term, and I guess I just don't know very much about it. What is quantitative easing, and what what are some like? I assume there's some sort of Austrian critique of it. Roger. Yeah, quantitative. Can you give me a microphone, please. Where's my mic? There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's a term that sort of rubs me the wrong way. I for some reason, or other. but typically, typically before quantitative easing, when, uh, when the interest rates were up around maybe three or four percent or something like that. Uh, you you could uh, the Fed could push those interest rates down by pumping in money, and they and they did that to the point where interest rate just got as low as it could go. Uh, and so if they tried to pump in more, they could pump in more. They did pump in more, but it didn't change the interest rate. It was already right down there against zero. And so that's when they started calling it quantitative easing. In other words, it was just that they're going to push more money out there despite the fact that it doesn't have any effect on interest rates. So that's, I mean, that's literally what the term means. Uh, normally, they would, when they say they're going to ease, they meant they're going to lower interest rates. But now they can't lower interest rates anymore. They're still going to ease. <laughs> it's just there's more money at the same low rates. So there's just a terminological thing that, it's an issue here. 
Also, um, there was a um, augmentation of the Fed's uh, use of a wider variety of securities in their purchases, right? So the typical open market operation uh, of the Fed would um, be confined to uh, U.S. Treasuries. So they instruct the New York Fed to purchase U.S. Treasuries and then provide the liquidity to the financial uh, markets from that purchase. Uh, with QE, they widen this out and they, they bought uh, almost $2 uh, trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities uh, as an example. They bought a lot of, uh, you know, uh, treasuries too. So, so QE, uh, that, that tends to be what we think of also, at least empirically, when, uh, when the term QE is, uh, is used, it, it tends to also have this implication that the Fed is widening the scope of securities that it, it will uh, purchase or sell. Yeah, just, just as an aside, the Federal Reserve Act and the other documents, the, the statutes that have amended the, the regulations, the rules uh, uh, that, that enable and constrain the Fed, you know, specifically limited the Fed's balance sheet to holding treasuries. The Fed was only legally allowed to hold U.S. treasuries, but there was this little escape clause, you know, except for, you know, uh, unusual uh, circumstances in, in an emergency, the Fed can hold other assets. Well, I mean, that's a, you know, a loophole that you can wide enough to drive through you know, a semi-truck or whatever. And so they jumped upon that in 2008 and started adding you know, huge, all kinds of securities in huge quantities to the balance sheet. Uh, yes, please. Um, you, you said earlier about 3D printing. Uh, does 3D printing decrease, uh, decrease the, amount, uh, this, the quantity of the stages of production? And if so, does the, do the higher triangles allow for a decrease in the stage of production and an increase in the growth of the economy? That's a question for Roger Garrison. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understood the question. So, if, yeah, I mean, so, so immediately produce any co complex good in one step, pushing one button. Well, no, before you say that, you'd have to look to see what, what's the whole process of creating the 3D printer. It, uh, obviously, once you have the 3D printer, then, then it's just no time that you can get, get an output from a certain input. Uh, but uh, overall, you'd have, to, you'd have to look at what are the inputs to the 3D printer. And that, that could well lengthen the structure of production. Okay, but of course it involves a change in technology, so we really can't say whether it lengthens it or shortens it until we look at the particulars. Yeah. And just keep in mind, you know, the biggest input is software, and it may be that it takes a long time to write the code that enables the 3D machine to produce some complex piece of machinery or whatever. Other questions? Yes, please. So, um, overview of two, you mentioned the uh, uh, behavioral economists, um, and my view is actually, I think, that they're an easy on this, uh, in that generally I think they are trying to, looking at somebody's actual preferences and trying to ascribe judgments to them as far as, well, you shouldn't have bought that, you should have bought something else. So, but I guess I can see from a, uh, maybe an entrepreneurial trying to explain mistakes, kind of standpoint why we might want to study that. So I'm curious if there's any scope that you think that has in this or where we can avoid um, starting making judgments about other people's actions as to you shouldn't have done that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So, so Mises wrote a book called Theory and History in 1956 that I highly recommend, and it talks about how you really apply economics to history. And he talked about, uh, he, he um, used the term phimology to indicate that you have to, not only do people have insights into one another when they act in the real world, that is, they have to understand one another, but that when the historian is, or the um, applied economist is doing economics, we have to understand the uh, goals and the ideals and, 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 and even the quirks and so on of, let's say, Alan Greenspan in, in, in the way he runs the Fed or, or Ben Bernanke. Uh, and I think behavioral economics, when it's properly used, can um, deepen our insights in some cases, as in the case of these speculative stories that I think are very important to keeping the boom going. Yeah, I'm going to add to that. There's a lot of truth. 
and the way that it's actually used. Um, behavioral economics is a science and you know, trying to get into what are people's preferences actually like, I find generally unobjectionable. It's basically a version of thymology. Um, but then what, what really ends up happening a lot of the time is that people have taken moral imperative that people should act rationally according to the neoclassical definition, and then the behavioral economists prove that people don't. So then the question is, what can we do to trick people into acting rationally? Right? Rather than just accepting, maybe people are loss averse because they really hate losses, and that's okay. Right? Maybe there's nothing wrong with this. Right? So uh, seeing behavioral economics as a critique of kind of this mainstream definition of rationality, I think is very useful. Um, using it to try to understand human behavior is very useful. Once we start adopting that mainstream notion of rationality as a moral imperative, that's where we start running into problems. I also want to add, I mean, I agree with what my colleagues have said about behavioral economics per se and how it can be useful. But I just want to add, as a, to be a little more cynical, you know, as a sort of empirical institutional matter, the current field of behavioral economics, I think, is massively bloated. There's a lot of malinvestment in that field. It's a fad. And a lot of the research that's coming out of behavioral economics is you know, coming up with bizarre laboratory scenarios to, to reach conclusions that are either uninteresting, not useful, or totally obvious to anyone who has done any thymology whatsoever. Um, like, like Dan Ariely, I think is the most, I think his stuff is, is pretty useless. Um, but he specializes in trying to use clever lingo to act as if he's come up with some new insight that in fact anybody in that specialized field of applied economics has already known for 50 years. So that's a good note to <laughs> close on. Thank you.